Good evening, everyone. It's Kim from the Pennington Public Library. Thank you for joining us this evening for our program, When a Bit Part Player Becomes the Protagonist, Examining the Impact of a Retelling with Joanne Epley Schmidt. This event is part of the 2024 NEA Big Read, an initiative designed to broaden our imaginations and understanding of our world, our neighbors, and ourselves through the joy of sharing a good book. Our featured book, which many of you know, is Circe by Madeline Miller, and it retells a Greek story from the eponymous heroine's point of view, giving voice to a lesser goddess of Homer's The Odyssey. NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. Before we start, if you have any questions during the program, please write them in the Q&A section. Please place all other comments in the chat window, as many of you have discovered. We'll be having a discussion at the end of the presentation. Also, special thanks goes to our on-camera participants today, including Diane, David, Holly, and Kathleen. Now for some background on today's presenter. The Reverend Joanne Epley Schmidt served for many years as an Episcopal priest in New Jersey, most recently as Associate Rector of Trinity Episcopal Church in Princeton. Joanne began her professional storytelling career in the late 1990s, serving as a teaching artist and storyteller in the juvenile justice system and in Trenton City Schools. She has performed and taught the art of storytelling in workshops and programs in schools, colleges, seminaries, churches, and retreat centers in the US and Canada. Currently, Joanne is serving as interim rector at St. Lawrence Anglican Church, just outside of Vancouver, Canada. As I mentioned before, this is Joanne's third time participating in a Pennington Big Read, and it is our pleasure to host her. Welcome, welcome, Joanne. All right, well, it is delightful to be with everyone again uh, for my third go round here with the Pennington Public Library and the Big Read. What a tremendous honor, and I have entirely enjoyed preparing for this evening. And I have done this uh, according to how the book struck me. So this certainly is not a book report, but it is my take on the book. Because the thing that strikes me most about the book Circe is that it just starts with a name. It just starts with a name. It's a name we've heard of, though we might not know exactly why, but it attracts our attention because we all have names, our own names, which we might like or we might not like, names which might have a meaning and what might suit us well or not suit us at all. Names were given by somebody else, which may or may not match how we choose to identify ourselves or how we see ourselves or how we would even name ourselves. It's a name that perhaps we have to live up to or live down, depending on the circumstances. And it's a moniker that carries this public presumption that it identifies us, which it may or may not actually do. So we have Circe. It's a, a sound, an assemblage of letter, letters, a, a signature, and for us, a, a signal that we exist, that we are here. So the subject we're here to consider tonight starts with a name, a name which functions as a title and a topic sentence. But the question of the hour is, whether the name is the identity, really. Is that actually Circe? It's a single word on the cover of the book that makes us curious enough to open the cover and continue. So we decide to seek her out. So we decide to seek her out. So imagine, imagine this. Imagine you actually tried to seek her out. So you set sail across the sea. You're sailing across, as, as they say in the ancients, the wine-dark sea of Greece, and you come up to the border, just the shoreline of her island, and your craft crunches into the sand that's golden sable sand. You step across the sand, leaving your footprints, and you find your way up a path that is dry, past dry 
bushes and sparse trees, past some animals and birds, and all the way up through the rocks, through a thick cloud of mist or fog. It's hard to tell exactly what it is that shields and shades and obscures everything. And you work your way all the way up until you find a front door of what appears to be a temple. And you come close. It's her name, Circe. You, you know who to look for. Because when you last saw Circe in Homer's great epic, she was standing in a, a white flowing gown with a golden buckle and a veil on her head and finely tressed hair. Kim, perhaps you could show us that image. There she is. That's how Homer has left her. So we know who to look for. So you're here on the island and you, you reach out to that great, on that great wooden door where there's a knocker and that smooth marble temple. And you make yourself known and a woman arrives at the door and there she is, it's Circe, the one you have read of. And you, you intake your breath, but she cuts you off. And she says, as she fills the doorway with her presence, she turns to you and she says, yes, I'm Circe. I'm a minor goddess in the Greek pantheon, cited in book 10 of Homer's great epic, The Odyssey. I'm often called a sorcerer, a danger, a cautionary character, an iconic image connoting indulgence and witchcraft. I threaten the gods, which is why I'm here, exiled on this island under a cloud to keep Athena off of my back. And they don't like me because I can conjure and unconjure according to certain circumstances and turn people into things and then turn them back, not as a superpower, but because I am a witch and I have a skill, which I was honest about, which is why I was banished here while my siblings, of course, they all shrank from the turf. Anyway, check the resources. They'll tell you all about me. And she steps back to close the door, but she sees you peering over her shoulder and you're puzzled because what you're seeing is not what you expected. You, you look over her shoulder and, and you notice you can see a kitchen. And in the kitchen, I don't know, there are smells of something on the stove, kind of odd, but interesting. And there are, there are half chopped herbs in a basin and, and water and various vials of certain things. And then all of a sudden there's a little child that goes speeding past, banging out the back door on his way out full holler. And then there are animals, which are clearly pets, but they're lions and they're wolves. And that's not really what you expect of lions and wolves because they're just shyly wagging their tails. And there's dirty dishes on the table and, and a sink in the basin and again that fragrance that's coming across the air which is something you can't quite identify but it's pleasing enough as it breezes past you with the breeze that's coming up from the ocean way down below and the lapping of the waves far down blend with the sound of that thing that is simmering and then you notice that the polished walls of her temple have greasy little handprints all over the place here and there. And over there, there's some crimson cloth on the chair, just as was described in the epic. But then there's yellow and green fabric over there on a loom. And what you see over her shoulder is not so much the realm of a goddess, major or minor, but just an ordinary woman's day, just beyond the Circe that you thought was a goddess. And you keep looking and she sees you notice and she pauses. Now Homer left her entirely attired in professional dress with appropriate professional hair. But here you've come up and found a woman dressed in practical clothing and hair that's really not so beautifully dressed after all, just yanked out of the way as she's doing her work. And there you are, face to face with Circe. So in book 10 of Homer's Odyssey, we hear his version of Circe. 
And smack in the middle of that chapter, there are two sentences that drew my attention. Kim, if you want to put up that first one there that's in English. There's here, this, this sentence, and it says, uh, Odysseus is speaking. So there, day after day, for a full year we abode, feasting on abundant flesh and sweet wine. But when the year was gone and the seasons turned, so there you have it. The story of Circe in his words, Odysseus's, uh, we were there and then we left. There's a real loud quiet between the end of one of those sentences where that ends with sweet wine and the one that begins, but when the year was gone, a real loud quiet in which I think something else might have occurred. But if you look at this same sentence in the Greek, Kim, if you could put up the Greek one, the way this looks on the page might be helpful to make my point. It is said by the ancient rabbis, in fact, that a story is written in black fire and in white fire. Now the irony here is on the screen, we've got white fire and black fire, it's inverted. But black fire traditionally is the ink on the page, which is the words of the story, which indicate the words you would read. But the white fire is the space between the letters, between the words, behind the ink, where the story resides. So in these strangely shaped letters to me, because honestly, that's Greek to me, I can't read it, there you can see some space between the letters and you can see the fire of the letters. And in between there is where the story resides. So these two sentences for me is the space between the black fire and the white fire of Circe's real story. Here in the middle of Homer's story is a portal through which we step into Circe's personal story. From the time Odysseus showed up, time passes, he leaves. This is the beginning of where we can step into the story and look back from this moment to everything that preceded this particular point in the story. And you can step into this for all the present that explains her life now. And this steps into the future, which we have yet to learn about. So here you are, you're on a threshold and she sees you looking and she sees you seeing. And in that moment, there is a decision that needs to be made. Could you put up the next screen for me, Kevin? In the last sentence of book 10 of Homer's Odyssey, it is written of Circe that she's she passed through the midst of us without our knowing it. She's making ready for Odysseus and her his crewmates to find their way on, to, to leave the island and continue on towards home. And while they're making ready, she passed through the midst of us without our knowing it. For who can see the comings and goings of a goddess if the godness does not wish to be seen? They don't see her. Who can see the comings and goings of a goddess if a goddess does not wish to be seen? But here we are at her doorstep, at a threshold with Circe, face to face. And as you stand there looking over her shoulder, she decides to be seen and invites you in. You can take that one down now, Kim, if you want. There you step in between the lines of one man's story into a world of meaning that Circe desires to reveal to us. And so now the minor goddess is the main protagonist and hers is the story for her to tell. 
So she's invited us in. She wishes to be seen. So let me just say a word then about how I personally understand and approach this particular kind of storytelling. I do not think of this as the retelling of a myth. I do not think of it as a legend of historic religion. I don't even think of it as a novel, really. I think of it as a memoir, something she is choosing to reveal, an intimate portrait of things she wants to tell us, to us, precious words with which we have been entrusted because she speaks to us as people she believes will believe her, when perhaps no one else to this point have even listened or known or chosen to care. Because there's, if there's one thing that I happen to learn in 10 years of working with incarcerated youth and in 36 years of pastoral ministry, there is power and also empowerment that comes when someone knows they are being believed. Having the confidence in the company we are keeping makes us remarkably free to say what we think is true, especially true of ourselves. So I approach this as a memoir, as one who chooses to be not like the gods, but to listen to her and to believe in her and not find her so dispensable, but to be one who believes her. So when I say Circe, I don't mean the goddess. I don't mean the novel. I don't mean the iconic character that gets referred to from time to time as the sorceress. I mean the person she has presented herself to be in front of me, who I choose to engage with as real. So that is how I will speak of Circe from here on out. Just someone who's chosen to let me see her and who's talking to me. Okay, now that we've said all that, what changes an ancient epic now that Circe can actually speak for herself? Well, there are a few things to say. It starts with her voice, her strange voice, as the gods say. It's thin, it's bird-like, it's already vaguely human, so it sounds strange, physically strange. But one can also say that there's the literary aspect of her voice. You know how they say there's a, a voice in a book, a voice in a poem. Well, she tells her story in a particular style with a particular perspective, which is her voice that to the gods sounds, as they say, strange. I wonder if it's because that voice with which she tells her story starts to express things that the gods and goddesses around her don't understand because she's speaking through the contours of compassion. She cares about humans. Is it that they don't understand what compassion sounds like? Is it because she speaks of unself-serving truth? I mean, for example, she rides in her father's chariot. She's riding with Helios, he pauses, and she knows in that moment, astronomers will die because the astronomers are supposed to know everything that happens in the heavens and he just changes something. And she voices her distress, but what she voices is incomprehensibly strange to him. And he pays no attention. And then there's Prometheus, in agony, and that agony tugs at her heart, and she struggles to come to his aid. And much day, one day, much later, she tells Helios what she has done. And where's his reply? We understand her to be expressing compassion, the shape of that and the texture and what that all feels like. But in the God's world, such contours are an insignificant dimension. She's mocked, she's dismissed, for she speaks of things that literally do not resonate with the priorities and caprices of the gods. And any marginalized and overlooked female knows that experience. Next thing, she creates 
a personal world that is described in living color. The worlds of the gods is lived in a particular palette. Kim, can you put up that gold palette? There we are. As you go through the book, you will notice the colors that are associated with the gods. They are bronze, they are golden, they have topaz eyes, they have golden blood. Sometimes there's silver or white, but clear yellow. And all of these are reflected of this metal, metallic, shiny world that shines back the light of Helios. It all comes with sort of a sunny, sunstruck glow about it, but it's hard, it's mineral, it's metallic. The God's own brilliance always reflected. It even starts with the black obsidian walls of his palace that are there just to reflect his golden bright light. So there we have the palette of the gods in her world, however, Kim, can you put up the next one? In her world, there are the vibrant colors of the rest of the spectrum. She speaks about the rich brown of the earth and the sable of the sand, but the blue of the ocean, the crisp white of salt, lush green grass, the blending of red of berries and blood. There's violet in flowers and the variegated tones of woven cloth. Crimson covering that chair, which we saw when we looked over her shoulder. And all of these colors uh, that are found in nature, she refers to as changing in autumn. Because these pigments come from plants and nature and that which you can touch and feel and change and move. And so there's that splendid stasis in the eternal God's metallic metal colors but here in her world, it turns organic and malleable and fragrant, sometimes smelly or flavorful or bitter or sweet, all of it staining her world with a vitality and a dimension that's exclusively hers to explain. Like when a great sailing vessel arrives on her shore, she explains, explains I, I knew of ships from paintings, a surface image that gave her information, but now has become a three-dimensional lived experience in the water that moves and the sails that blow and the texture of the wood that has landed. So in, in, in many cultures, in Greek culture, icons are drawn in two dimensions on a solid surface, but given time, to look at them carefully, they draw you into the world living inside. Circe has always been called an icon, but Circe herself is giving us time that the great epics the men wrote never gave her. You can take that screen down if you want to, Kim. Another thought. Epics, as you know, are often full of violence. There is great difficulty, however, in dealing with the scenes of violence in Circe's life, when it's violence that is specific to her, a vulnerable person alone. So that in mind, I have to say, I always feel sorry for pigs. Because pigs are in and of themselves perfectly noble, intelligent animals, but unfortunately, they also become the image of absolutely ignominious behavior. So while I think it's very unfortunate that some of Odysseus's crew members had to spend some time in a pig sty, biding their time, I'm also aware that it is the graphic nature of what she suffered when some others came to her shores somewhat before Odysseus and the crew members, when those others breached her shoreline, breached her world, breached her, in fact, once before. And knowing that part of the story shifts the perspective and the meaning of why the crew members were suddenly turned into 
pigs. So when you come to that tagline, oh, Circe, she's the goddess that turns people into pigs. That's a simplistic assessment that reduces her to sort of a literary trope or a saying or sort of a bumper sticker. Because it took Circe real courage to tell us the story of that assault. And it takes a little bit of courage to really read it as well. Because it is the lived experience of more women than should ever be true. And it hereby is one of the other things that makes the particular memoir so meaningful. Because James Hillman is a psychologist who wrote that young people who are in very difficult circumstances always psychologically do better if they know that their personal story is part of a bigger narrative. They do better psychologically, even if their own circumstances don't change, they do better when they know they're part of a bigger story. So for Circe to, to, to trust us with the details of her assault, she is no longer alone and neither are any of us who might have experienced the same thing she experienced. Those of us in whom she has confided, who might know more closely than we would want to exactly what she's talking about. And then here's one more thing that would never make it into a hero's story, but what can be more elemental to a heroine's journey than the experience of gestation and giving birth? whether it is to a great idea or initiative or to an actual other being. It's always a phenomenal accomplishment. So to, to speak of the birth, I have to confess that the language that her sister uses towards her when she summons Circe to help her assist in birthing the Minotaur absolutely infuriated me. She is so cruel and so rude and so diminishing and dismissive. So again, I have to say, I don't think of this as a myth because in my experience, there are many women who have spoken just like that within my hearing and many women who have been spoken to just like that, that I am aware of. So I'm glad Circe gave it a little bit of airtime, what it feels like and it looks like to be spoken to so horribly so others will know that they also are not alone and they also know that they can choose to escape. So they know that it's not a human or humane way to talk to anyone, but okay. Because of that, when Circe finally comes to the moment of giving birth herself, she's all alone and she's on her own. She hasn't got any lore. She has no mothering, no sister to really draw from for modeling or family experience or even cultural experience to draw from about what to do in this moment. She's utterly on her own. And so she does, as you know, what she needs to do to successfully give birth to her son. In some um, African cultures, the dangerous and arduous effort of actually giving birth is named as going to the war front. So if the men in epic literature go into battle with their compatriots, this minor goddess exiled to an island alone goes through a mortal battle herself, just as fierce, just as important, but alone. So when this bit part player becomes the protagonist, the elements of an epic remain, but the purpose and the place and the person can change. And then of course, so does the language because the high art of rhetoric is utterly lost in every squeamish detail of the agonizing experience that she who is utterly aghast by the visceral agony and power of giving birth, 
chooses to share with us. It's uh, it's linguistic accuracy that is an art, but it's much too real to just be rhetoric. Which is then, of course, now that she's gone through this and given birth, it is followed by the spinning chaos of the early experience of motherhood and the sights and the sounds and the spills and the smells and the confusion and the dismay and the disarray, a detailed and debilitating pivotal moment for her that will shape every single decision that she makes going forward in her story. She has no model, no mother, and no means by which to understand what's going on this first time around though. I mean, do any of us. We can all read the books, but it's not the lived experience. But in this moment are the ethics and the morals and the love and the values that drive the rest of the story that splattered out before us in glorious living color in that particular pivotal moment. And another thing that comes into the, the epic story, if there ever was an image or a model of womanhood, of wifehood, of motherhood for Circe, it would be Penelope. Because no such image exists for her in the world of the gods. So from early on in her relationship with Odysseus, Circe is fascinated by Penelope because she inquires and she listens very deeply. Like, what is it about this woman that makes her so deeply sought? She's a destination. She is a goal for her husband all these years, for the suitors all the way around her, the soldiers that guard her her son that stands by her side. What is this paragon of womanhood, of mortal human femininity that is strong and capable and so esteemed as to warrant a decade or more and some dangerous sea for one man to return to her? And when at last Circe wants us to know most about when they, when at last they meet, what Circe wants us to know most is that she and Penelope form a bond. They form a friendship even. They see each other. What she wants us to know most about meeting Penelope is that they could share a man. They could share a loom, which in some cultures is apparently practically the same thing. And they could also share some down and dirty girl talk, because who but each other could really understand the wiles of wily Odysseus? And who but each other could carefully and observe what the other one had experienced? And who would find not friction, but friendship between mortal and goddess, wife and mistress, because what they come to realize they share most essentially is their desire to become truly themselves, be it goddess or mortal. Circe begins her story recalling how her compassion for humans was met with derision. She ends her story by telling us how her compassion for humans propels her vision because Penelope was an icon to Circe until they met face to face. And when they understand one another's stories behind the icon, now they are both free to make their own metamorphosis from icon to individual. So let me kind of close this out by reflecting that, you know, time and time again, through time, a female, the feminine, is presented in service to the purposes of a larger narrative so much of the time. In epic, Circe, that flat icon, is in service to a larger 
man's narrative. Iconic, but not individual. Publicly known, but not personally understood. There can be faces and figures for what this feels ancillary and subservient to who she actually is. And not enough for the image to be necessarily effective. That's what happens when someone becomes just, uh, you know, iconic. And it happens and happens and happens again for women in literature, for women in culture, for women that we know in experience, especially the marginalized, the overlooked, and the ones who are given a title like, oh, she's the one who turns people into pigs. There's always more to the story. There are so many iconic faces. Kim, if you could put these up just one at a time, it would be helpful. There are faces we know that are the image of an era and a moment. The Afghan girl, that's what we know. But she has a whole story that we've never been able to get into and understand fully. She's an icon, but she has a story. Can you go with the next one? These beautiful photographs by Dorothea Lang, so many of them all taken in the 1930s in the Dust Bowl, they are the image of that experience. But there's the picture in service of a larger narrative. We do not know her story and we never will because it's just her image that was published and her image that carried interest not the details of who she really is. Can you go to the next? Now there's one that an awful lot of us were raised on. There's Ann Turner Cook. She was born, I think in 1927, but in 1931, she was trademarked and put on the baby food jar. And it was not until the mid 1970s that it was even revealed who she actually is. There was a rumor that that little baby was actually Elizabeth Taylor or my personal favorite, that it was Humphrey Bogart. But there she is. And do we know the rest of the story? Not until the 1970s could you even find out what it is. And she was a teacher, she was a writer, she was a grandmother, a great grandmother, and she lived well into her nineties. But that's who we saw for a long time, an icon of our upbringing. Next one, Ruby Bridges, there in Norman Rockwell's painting. She has a whole story of her own, but there she was as a six-year-old, the image of the civil rights era, the image of school integration. She carried a whole story on her back in that painting. And to this day, we really have never heard the rest of who she really is. She's an icon in service of a much larger narrative. The next one. There's Sacagawea, sort of. It's not really Sacagawea. She was put on that coin to replace Susan, Susan B. Anthony. But there she is carved into metal, which in her own culture would have only been used for sacred objects, not metal. And we know her as the one who helped Lewis and Clark, as the one who was forced into a marriage to a Quebecois man. We don't really know what any of that experience was like for her because that part wasn't written down. What was written down was what she did for the others. But she has now been immortalized on a coin, a little boy on her back, the model for whom was actually the nephew of the artist who carved the image, both of whom are from German heritage. So we've heard of Sacagawea, but if that's all we know on that dollar coin, we really don't know her. And the next. Olive Oatman is an interesting one. She's referred to as the tattooed girl. 
she was kidnapped uh, in, uh, I think, uh, 1850 in Yuma, New Mexico. And then the story is that perhaps she was enslaved by the tribe that captured her, or she was sold to another. In any event, over time, she came back into white culture. But for the rest of her days, she was the tattooed girl who had been captured by the Indians. And the details of the rest of her story are very hard to dig up. So she becomes an icon of that time when uh, the savages had to be uh, tamed. The next. And then we have Elliot Page. And at last, who's now an icon on the cover as someone who's trans, who does have a story because that's the cover of the book and inside is the rest of the story. So maybe we're making progress and understanding there's more to be said always. You can take that one down, Kim, while I just close. Because time and time and time again, a female is an icon who is someone else's iteration, but not an individual. But now in her own voice, Circe is that individual. And we are fortunately now deeply into an era of explaining and expanding our understanding of identity in all forms across race and culture and religion and gender and ability or different ability. So what I come down to is wondering if this particular telling of Circe's personal story is needed now in a particular way. It certainly confirms the quest to become a junior, a really human But maybe in it, there's also the encouragement to anyone who's felt overlooked or marginalized to take charge of their own story, to be heard on one's own story. Maybe that is why Circe aspires to be human. Redefine some of those terms because we are not myths, we're not images, we're not icons. Nobody truly knows us from the outside, which is why I think of this book not as a retelling of a myth, nor a novel, nor a legend, but as a memoir. Because on the cover of things, literally, She's presented to us as a bronze goddess. Could you put up, put up that cover? There she is in the colors of the goddess as we would expect at the outset. But if you can go to the next one, when she's revealed to us in the black fire and the white fire, she comes to life because behind the black fire, the white fire of her, is expressed because she has consented to be seen by us. What goddess can be seen unless she desires it? And she has desired it for us. So perhaps as we turn to one another, we will look more carefully and listen more deeply and assume less and inquire more of those we meet from day to day. And maybe we need to be reminded that it is not good for anyone to be cramped by the black fire of someone else's construction of who they think we ought to be. No one is a myth. No one is an icon. No one is an interpretation of what someone thinks you're supposed to be. People are disempowered by being assigned a narrative. Circe saw us look over her shoulder and let us in and let herself be seen. And in so doing, maybe she encourages us to let ourselves be seen, to be known by one another. And by the end of her telling, she disappears into being human. So she could surface subsequently anywhere, anytime, 
in anyone, even in one of us. So maybe she is asking us to remember and respect that everyone has her own story to tell and there is always more to that story. Thank you. That is how I see the book on Circe. Thank you so much, Joanne. You're very welcome. That was a very insightful talk and I had such a pleasure putting together the images with you for this. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your thought process when you were putting together the images and when you were just putting together this talk for us in general? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it's there are so many images in the course of the book. One could go on and on and on. But I think, for example, that uh, one of the images that first was the first one that came to my mind or the first notion that came to mind is when she's described in her white dress with her golden belt and her veil and her finely tressed hair. And I found myself thinking about the Crown Act from California, you know, uh, I've forgotten the number of the uh, you know act of Congress that it is, but it is the uh, the act that says you can no longer discriminate on someone uh, according to their hairstyle. You don't have to quote unquote have professional hair anymore, because I was trying to think why does this book matter to me now, and it was the contrast of that had just come up on the news because someone was citing the Crown Act because of her hair, and this notion because it comes through. The, the Odyssey a lot of, you know, her finely tressed hair, her finely tressed hair. And I thought, okay, uh, what else do we have that's so very visual? Um, and because I'm a visual thinker, those are those, those are those thoughts that come to mind. And I did particularly appreciate your digging out the Greek for that text so that we could look at letters that were maybe not as familiar unless people do read Greek, so that we could see the difference between the black and fire and the white fire, though it's interesting in that particular screen that it was white fire and black fire. Same idea applies, no doubt. Yes, it's so interesting because the Odyssey, having um, developed from an oral tradition, mm -hmm. one of the key aspects of the Odyssey are the stock epithets. Mm -hmm the descriptions of the mm -hmm. characters that are repeated mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. order to tell that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, story orally. And you know, you're a storyteller, so you're well aware. So mm -hmm. you will have uh, you know, the characters, the, the dark eyed one or mm -hmm. um, in that repetition, but it's interesting how that can, for lack of a better way to put it, stereotype the characters yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, it, it it is it does function as exactly that. I was working one time, uh, I was up at Middlebury College doing a, a storytelling and uh, for teachers, and a young man who was a teacher came, and he said, "I've been asking the administration for the longest time if we could just like tell the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey, but they keep saying no, 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 it has to be read. They, the kids have to read the book." And he said, I'm so frustrated. I said, have you pointed out to them that it was written down as a last resort because people were forgetting how to tell it? Uh, because I mean, that's what it's for. It's supposed to be. And I, I would imagine if you could hear it, there would that that sonorous tone and those handholds would be like, I mean, like a chorus in a song. Uh, but those repetitions are, they're, they're like hooks so that you know where you are as a teller, you are in that place. But they also do reduce a moment to uh, uh, a marker. And if it's a person, they kind of get re reduced to that marker also. But it is a function of the oral telling as well. You're right. Yes. I think we have a question from one of our attendees. Um, it's actually an interesting question. Uh, do you think Martha from the book of Luke in the Bible needs her story, quote unquote, retold? before and after her encounter with Jesus? Oh, there are so many, you know, someone's calling on my uh, my real calling. One of, the, uh, one of the notes I did not include because I thought that it felt, it felt uh, possibly preachy is uh, there's a, a story in one of the gospels where someone comes and uh, breaks a, an alabaster bottle of, of fragrant perfume on Jesus's feet. And it says, this will always be told in memory of her. And that's it, that's all we know. We don't know her name. We don't know anything else about her. There's a there's a whole big thick uh, feminist theological book written called In Memory of Her. So yeah, I think there are a whole lot of people 
whose stories need to be told because it puts dimension into into the gospels and in fact if you dig around in a good theological library you can find all the stuff that didn't make it into the canon which does tell some of those stories in ways that are maybe more provocative than the original editors of that particular sacred text uh wanted to have out there but um one of the values of doing uh of being a preacher is having the freedom sometimes to create or research or try to put back together somebody's backstory, which I've done a few times. And uh, it's it's remarkably effective because you want something to live. You want a story to live, not just lie on a page. If many of you haven't figured it out already, um, I think one of my greatest joys about putting together a big lead is actually to hear everyone's stories. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes uh, the book that we have chosen help bring forth all of those stories from all of you. I know the, the last book we did two years ago, The Best We Could Do, uh, which mm -hmm. was about a Vietnamese immigrant. Suddenly I was getting all of these emails or people coming up to me telling me their own histories about their families um, who had immigrated here. Um, and in, in this case, when I read Cersei, I thought, wow, you know, her voice is so different than I think anyone would have imagined. Like you said, Joanne, she's sort of just been summarized as, oh, here's the witch who turned men into pigs. Right. And I guess it surprised me because I hadn't even thought about her. Sometimes we just take for granted what we're shown. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I hadn't even thought any further, any deeper about the character. What surprised me at reading the book, uh, I, I mean, I'm not kidding that, that that birth scene with her sister, it genuinely infuriated me because I, uh, in my experience of, you know, working in many circumstances and, you know, just being part of a family, listening to her sister talk to her that way, I, I was really surprised by how angry I was reading the book because I don't usually get that worked up about something, especially if I'm trying to sort of think analytically. But I couldn't get past that because I didn't really think that goddesses had that horrible experience of being sp spoken to so rudely or that other goddesses were, seemed to be so sort of sociopathically self-absorbed. <laughs> the rest of them don't come off very well <laughs> in a lot of cases, except for, I don't know, you know, Hermes and Prometheus, they have a little, you know, a little care within them, but... But I, I am yeah. curious for folks, I don't know if there's a way to do that, but uh, with the screen as it is and in the time frame and the technology, but I, I always am curious to hear back from people of the parts that moved them in the story or or surprised them or were a moment where you go, oh, that's, uh, I know that, I know that. I think there's some rough moments. We had talked, Kim and I had talked about, you know, how do you account in a public setting like this for some of the violence you know, um, the sexual violence in the book, that sort of thing. You know, you can't, could, but not in this context, perhaps go into that. And yet, you know, you read that knowing that for readers, for some, that will be uh, nowhere near a myth. It will only be fact. Um, but the birth narrative and also just the, I think that with the early days of dealing with the baby, I thought, oh my gosh, that seems so very accurate to me. <laughs> I see a hand uh, up. Yes, uh, Kathleen. Yes, hi, good. Joanne, thank you so much for that conversation. Um, there's just two points I, I wanted to make, not really having to do with any scene from the book that, are, that resonated, but what I really appreciated with you um, tonight distilling was how her compassion, Cersei's compassion mm -hmm. is overlooked. And I feel like that's such a universal theme like this, you know, in a cynical age, you know, it's, 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 um, it's dismissed. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, I, you know, I guess I hadn't really seen that when I was reading the book, but I appreciated you bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I was, was reminded of when you were talking about, you know, just women's representation is, have you heard of the Bechdel test in film? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, Alison Bechtel, I think I was just looking it up actually. Um, she does this measure of women's representation mm. and um, it's, it's um, 
to be to be you know positively represented it's have at least two women in a film um the second part is that they talk to each other and the hmm. third part is that they talk about something else besides a man yeah uh-huh and, and uh, you know it, i guess it's quite rare and i thought in this book you know even though it's all um you know cersei by herself um at the end with her and penelope mm-hmm. uh, you know that they she's achieved the she's passed the test i guess you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's really that's really interesting. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Holly. Yeah. Um the, the only thing one thing I didn't like about her is when those the nymphs were who were women were sent to her island for a year or two. Oh, yeah. She did nothing for them, didn't try to relate to them or make them see the error of her ways. I know she had been hurt by other nymphs before she got to the island, but but you'd think she would have tried at least to bond with one or change one or two. Yeah. They didn't count for anything to, in her mind. So it's true. It, it is as if they're just sort of flitting around and I you know one of them gets sort of contrary there for a little while. But they are very much background material. So that's an interesting thing to point out that there she is doing exactly what she's trying to undo for herself. She's doing at somebody else in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great aspect to point out, Holly. And it always reminds me of, I guess there's often a lot of talk to, uh, nowadays about trauma and how it's passed on or whether or not you can break the cycle. And I think it's something that's definitely very relatable for people who have undergone any sort of, I guess, Mm -hmm. psychological abuse Mm -hmm. is that struggle to break free from that cycle and not to continue it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I appreciate it that the beginning of the book, she's, she makes it evident. She doesn't want to be part of this story. And, uh, you know, I, I can imagine reading this in certain contexts where folks would say, oh, I can break free from a a narrative that's not mine, a narrative that confines me or misunderstands me. Um, yeah, just, yeah. A, just a thought that came to mind as you were saying that. Diane, did you have anything to add? I was uh, struck by thinking about all, all the the backgrounds as you described it, this the stories that are not told and 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 the labels that actually further mask and make unavailable those stories. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, I, I'm wondering, like we have a sense of, I don't know, the landscape or the whole or however you want to describe it. And if we got to some of the background stories like Cersei's, how many of those would then change our perception of the larger landscape. Mm -hmm. So that by looking at the individual stories, you start to say, wait a minute, my whole understanding of relationships or of the world has been off because we haven't heard these voices. And and, and it's a a selected group that we're not hearing from. It's it's the women, it's the oppressed. It's, I think that's particularly evident, Diane, in, um, uh, you know, anti-racist struggles. Um, I'm currently working in British Columbia. Uh, Canada is ahead of America in paying attention to what has happened to the Native people, the Indigenous population there. Um, British Columbia, in the Anglican Church anyway, is a little ahead of the curve and is paying a lot of attention. And all of a sudden, a whole lot of institutions have to change how they're doing things and have to re-understand uh, who they are. Uh, and it's very striking, you know, as the, it's now, it's very it's very foregrounded uh, in the culture there. When you go into any building, there will be a land acknowledgement on whose territory are you actually working? And the effort there is to not let that just become sort of a rote thing, but, a genuine acknowledgement that if you're a settler, I'm a settler, you're uh, it, you're a visitor where somebody's land uh, 
is. But it, it's interesting just to be in a different country, uh, in a different uh, coast, uh, different culture entirely, that is trying to foreground that and how that does shift mm -hmm. uh, one's perception of oneself quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I have, if I can piggyback on Diane's comment, I had one thought, and that's on, on the iconic figure, whether somebody, the price of being iconic is loss of texture, mm -hmm. which you made very, you had great images, uh, Joanne, mm -hmm. as you always do. And I wonder about whether people, I thought the migrant woman was, the picture of her was a haunting, mm -hmm. and I wonder if she wants to be remembered is the position of the Dust Bowl. Yeah. Maybe she wants to be remembered. I was a terrific mother yeah. through an incredibly awful time. Yeah, I had to deal with this, this, and this, and I survived, and I did this. I was mm -hmm. strong. I was resolute. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I was depressed and hurt and suffered. Right. right. You know, the, the, the price of being an icon is you lose any texture at all, yeah. and you don't get to define yourself. You mm -hmm. are left to others to define you. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think that that's the, that's kind of the, the heart of the matter. And, uh, I, and I would wager that any one of us at some point or another has been, has been even just casually, uh, had someone refer to us as, you know, like you're the one who <laughs> turns people and things, you know, it, it, someone will have, to, will typecast us according to what they sort of see and figure that's pretty much it. Uh, but those big icons, you know, it, it, yeah. I mean, who, who knows what the rest of her story is? And she was obviously a strong mom, mother. There she is in the Dust Bowl with two kids hanging on her. So more to the story, always more to the story. And in an era where we are infinitely connected through all this electronic, it would be really wise to recognize that we're still communicating on flat surfaces so there still is, uh, you know, we still need to move beyond that too, because otherwise everyone starts to feel like what they see on a flat screen is still truth. And and it isn't, it's just a little device that's not the whole picture at all. Well, Joanne, that is a wonderful note <laughs> to wrap up our lovely conversation with. Um, and I just want to thank you all for joining us this evening for this lovely conversation and lovely talk. Um, we have many more programs in the works. <laughs> I'm actually excited because um, next Wednesday, we have Adra Sherman, who is a docent at the Princeton University Art Museum, who will be joining us on Zoom and showing us artifacts um, some of you may know that the Princeton University Art Museum is under renovation right now, and they are not slated, according to Adria, to reopen until spring 2025. They are undergoing huge changes, but luckily for us, they took high resolution pictures of many of the items, if not all of the items in their collection, before they were packed away. So Adriel will be examining some of those Greek artifacts, ancient Greek artifacts with us next Wednesday evening. So uh, feel free to sign up and join us. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, and you've left us with a lot to <laughs> think about, Joanne. <laughs> As you Thank have you left me with a lot to think about too. <laughs> I know, I know. So I wanna thank you once again third time's a charm, but, you know, every time it's been a charm with you. So <laughs> thank you, Kim. And, I, I yeah. very much appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to think about something differently than I might have if I was just reading it on my own. So thank you. Yes. Yes. Good evening, everyone. And uh, have a relaxing, wonderful time until the next time on Zoom. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Good night.